what I'll be doing in the next 10 minutes or so is really sort of give you a, a kind of live <laughs> illustration of um, how I, as an academic, doing research, doing teaching, and also doing writing for non-academic platforms, have really benefited from, um, from what the OED has to offer. Um, so a quick introduction here. I am actually currently um, based at Curtin University in the School of Education, but I have my roots go long and deep uh, in Hong Kong. I was at the University of Hong Kong for nine years until um, the middle of 2018. Um, and I still hold an honorary associate professorship position with the School of English at Hong Kong U. Um, and a lot of my work continues to be based on things going on, languages and issues going on in Hong Kong. Um, just very quickly, some of the things that I work on involve um, work on language contact, uh, language variation and change and, you know, ongoing um, evolution of language with a focus on world Englishes, <clears throat> especially in multilingual ecologies of Asia, but also with interests in minority and endangered um, uh, communities and the languages um, that are considered heritage languages, as well as uh, languages of shift for these communities. What I also do is write for um, the South China Morning Post Sunday Post magazine, a fortnightly column on language matters, um, where I talk about all sorts of things to do with language, sometimes very um, um, wider sociolinguistic issues or issues to do with um, the the invention of Braille or the fact that it's um, um, World Autism Day, etc. But I also like looking at lots of lexical items, especially those related to world Englishes, um, and you know, to trace the kinds of journeys that um, these words have traversed, the kinds of um, communities that have been involved and the languages in contact that have brought the words to where they are today. And you know what, I've just put a few there which are of particular relevance, I think, to our current audience, words like milk tea, typhoon, shroff, and many, many more. And um, a lot of this, the work that I do looking at evolution of language also goes into my research writing, but I think for today it's more fun to look at um, these shorter um, column pieces to illustrate how I really, um, you know, draw on the information in the OED. Um, at this point, I also want to, to say uh, that, you know, um, what has been a wonderful development in the OED is the in increased attention to World English is spearheaded by Danica as, as World English um, editor. Many, many years ago, she spoke at a conference, a World English conference, and I can't tell you how excited it was for me as an acad academic to actually, in, you know, have somebody actually um, straddling the, 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 the areas of academia as well as, as industry and talking about how, you know, we can, um, um, benefit from each other's work and I think from then um, our collaboration has has you know started then Danica and just went on um, until now so I'm really um, it's been a, a wonderful initiative which has helped boost recognition of world English varieties and in turn has supported further research teaching etc in the field of world Englishes. Okay, so the fact that you know one can tell one's students, look at that, you know, Shroff included in uh, in um, the OED. We move on then. So let me first talk about you know how the OED actually helps with research and world Englishes. Looking, for example, at etymology. So as mentioned, you know, one of the thrusts of the things that I do and write about um, is really sort of digging deep, trying to find. Um, you know, threads and paths, some very clear, sometimes not very, not so obvious, um, of, of the origins of lexical items. And um, the OED actually provides quite a, um, a comprehensive um, offer of etymology for, for their entries. And this is one example that I worked on a 
few a handful of years ago, but um, you know uh, is a really rich um, source of information, as you can see here, um, giving information on how you actually have two um, uh, forms and two possible you know origins. One um, f likely from Urdu, Persian, and Arabic meaning a violent storm of wind and rain, tempest, hurricane, tornado, and you find, and then, you know, with, with examples of the word itself um, in Arabic and so on. And then another form, possibly from Chinese Taifung, and again, you know, giving various um, bits of information about those forms. And, and these may be very sufficient, these may need further um, um, investigation and looking up of primary sources, but in but you know for the most part they are a fantastic um, start a fantastic springboard um, to um, identifying uh, where various lexical items originate and so what you see in the box at the top is very recognizably from the OED the box below that just represents just an example a paragraph from um, one of my columns on Typhoon and you can see how. Um, you know, the information from the OED has really helped inform uh, my research and my writing on, um, on this particular lexical item. In addition to etymology, um, the OED is um, chock full and really rich with attestations um, going, you know, going back um, very far and detailing uh, interesting moments, interesting milestones, and lots of variation in between. So again, we have an example from the OED about milk tea, uh, and then the two boxes, just more examples from this, from my column where I wrote about tea and particular, no, actually this one is about milk tea, specifically, especially when the milk tea alliance um, movement was um, ongoing. Um, and again, one can see how uh, the information in OED has really helped inform things, not just in terms of, well, there's a very direct reference in this particular case of how, it, how it's defined in the OED, but with um, um, inclusion in what I've researched and what I've written um, based on these really fantastic um, bits of documentation in the OED from the uh, 1819, 1897 um, public, as far back as the 1897 publication, which refers to Nai Cha, milk tea, drunk in the Manchu court. And you can see in the top box, you know, that's mentioned, that's given mention there. And, and then um, when it's when it starts to appear on English language um, uh, platforms, such as the South China Morning Post in 1966. And um, again, that is reflected in, you know, in marking the various moments and routes that a particular lexical item has taken. Um, what is also very nice when looking at attestations is that um, these aren't just limited to kind of ob very obvious English language works, but also English language translations from um, other language sources. And so this is an example of Typhoon. Okay, and I mean, I've just taken snippets of some of, of bits of the entry in the OED. And this particular um, part of it, which as you see in the top, um, box, right? A violent storm or tempest, a violent cyclonic storm or hurricane occurring in the China seas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can see that for the alpha um, forms, the earliest attestations are 1588, and these are English translations of, you know, some other uh, some other writings uh, in other languages. Can okay, this actually, you know, is found? Um, um, across all, all the entries in the OED, and um, they they support you know our understanding and our appreciation of world Englishes as not just being English, right? But clearly, um, you know, English as it is also or um, you know originating in or being influenced by other communities and other languages and written about so a lot of the times when you trace um, how a word has changed its form you actually see 
how it depends on how it's um, it's been taken on and represented in some other language, right? But Portuguese, in many cases, especially when we're talking about the Asian and Southeast Asian region, Portuguese, the, the Portuguese being one of the earliest explorers, European explorers in the region, often were the ones to encounter um, and adopt various terms from the local languages and then write about it. And also because um, you know the Portuguese of the region was also a lingua franca for explore, later explorers to the region, these words would then come through um, Portuguese or and or other um, European languages into English. Okay, so looking or being able to see translate um, you know sources which come from translations of other languages is also a very rich part of what we can find in the OED. Um, in a, uh, one more thing about when doing research um, is the ease in which you can find cross references. So, in what we see is if we look, if we were looking at bubble tea, for example, um, so in the square in the middle, and um, this was still part of my column on, on milk tea. So, started making reference to bubble tea. What you have there, if you see in the box in the middle, bubble tea, a cold drink of Taiwanese origin, so on and so forth. And at the very end of that, you have, you know, CF boba, right? So cross-reference to the entry for boba. Look there, so that's the now the box, um, the bottom half of the screen. You see uh, the entry um, etymology from Chinese, so giving the translation of what boba is. And then later on, just in the middle, um, the usual Chinese word, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of that, where you see a cross-reference to milk tea as well. Okay, So various entries here are very nicely related to each other. So even if you didn't know um, that you had to, you know, that boba was related to it, you'd be pointed to it in one way or another. Okay, And then as usual, um, what we can see as well is um, the diversity of attestations, okay? um, where you see after the definition, a cold drink of Taiwanese origin, et cetera, et cetera. And you see the first attestation there for Boba, it's uh, 2000 in the Los Angeles Times. Okay, So again, very nicely illustrative of the movement, right? the, the spread of world Englishes um items from where they originate to where they have spread you know if, because of the diaspora or, or various other global phenomena okay so a small you know snapshot of how the oed can be really so um useful when looking up origins language contact um dynamics movement evolution Teaching world Englishes is also uh, also another important part of what I do. And um, over the decades of teaching, amongst the various things I do is very often and almost always run units on either called world Englishes or global Englishes or in a common core curriculum course, English as a global language in Asian context and the like. And, um, what has been a very important impetus, I think, when talking about world Englishes, it's not just, you know, to describe what's going on or to get familiar with various world Englishes, but also sort of critically reflect on the position of world Englishes, especially newer varieties. And of course, you know, if, because of my personal and, and professional preference, I often think about or talk about Asian varieties, you know, and why they have partic a particular status, why certain um, lexical items may be viewed as more intelligible and therefore more acceptable and why others not. Okay? And so this, this is, um, this is an uh, example of um, exercise that I have given my students over the years. Okay, So for example, get into small groups, pretend you're working with a dictionary, look at these sets of words below, which would you accept, right? And this is really to challenge students. If you accept, as you would because it's British English, council estates, etc., why not HDB, which is what you find in Singapore, why not other kinds of versions, okay? Let's jump actually to something like point three, okay, the set of words in three. If we accept or if we're happy with words like cappuccino, for example, or cookie, 
yeah, or well, focaccia, uh, you know, why ever not words like adobo or pancit or um, naicha, right? They are all once upon a time, if not most more recently, but then further back in time, words which actually came in from a different language. Similarly, with set four, you have cafeteria, which or originally comes from um, uh, café, coffee, and terria, a place where business is done, from originally from Spanish, um, but of course over time has become part of English. So nobody blinks an eye thinking about cafeteria. But then, you know, why not something like a pancitería, which, as which you would have in Philippine English, right? And why, you know? So, so through exercises like this, and through then looking at the OED, sending my students to look at the OED, you know, we ask ourselves, right, uh, um, you know, issues about standards, about intelligibility, and about acceptability. Um, and then the next slide just takes us along to another part of the kinds of exercises that I talk about with students. So this is kind of the next step, right? So once, you know, we have uh, in the early in the ex exercise I've just shown you, you know, once students have sort of laughed about it and sort of debated about why they would not or would not put Chasu Pao in a dictionary, you know, we go and look at what dictionaries do do, right, and what are they meant to do? Um, are, are they meant to prescribe? Are they meant to describe or capture what is actually current um, in a particular community of speakers? We look at what may be considered traditional, and I put that in quote marks, in more established dictionaries, and give examples of how these actually are going along this path of increasing their scope of um, world English, new English lexis. Okay, so Macquarie, for example, has of course been well known for um, this promoting, establishing um, um, Australian English, but has also been very much involved in um, advising and, and working, collaborating on scholars um, working on Asian English dictionaries. Um, Singapore had its Times Chambers Essential English Dictionary with Singapore and Malaysian entries, and of course, the OED. Um, and as I say, I often send students to go and look at the entries there, examine and you know ask themselves questions about the items and the challenges um, involved in working or, or, or working in such an initiative. I'll jump right down because time is short. I'll jump right down to the last question. And uh, and so, you know, I um, lead the students on to asking ourselves then, you know, how do we get, you know, new English lexis, world Englishes, um, and give them enough currency to get them into dictionaries, right? If they have used enough, observed enough, um, have currency in a speech community, then um, uh, they're good contenders. And the answer really is to love your words and to use them. And let me just really give you a now, just to end up a very quick example of a life cycle of uh, what happened with a particular um, phrase and how before my very eyes, actually over a number of years, we saw add oil, uh, make it into the OED, which was a huge moment for, <laughs> for me. Um, and as recently as 2015, so this was an article in 2015, which was written by a Hong Kong based um, journalist. And, you know, he had, uh, he had um, pitched an idea to the um, SCMP Post magazine to write about Hong Kong English. Um, at that time, I didn't have my column going at all. Um, I was an unknown. <laughs> but um, uh, um, because of my work, this journalist spoke to me and we talked about Hong Kong English words and he was looking up, you know, um, um, a, a, another publication uh, about Hong Kong English, Fragrant Harbor, which had been compiled, compiled by other academics and, you know, writing about some of these words like shroff and nulla and so on, the classic Hong Kong English words. And because of this opportunity to talk to him, I was telling him about, you know, words that were appearing on the scene because of computer mediated communication and increased bilingualism etc and various things i talked about uh, included um, this term add oil okay and i sort of highlighted that section there in in his article with the purple highlighter so you know talked about what add oil is and at the very end you know mentioning that because of the 2014 um, umbrella movement the add oil machine which was um, um, projecting words of support, etc., to the protesters down in Central, um, which you know was really bringing 
this term add oil uh, to the whole world because of this particular political event um, that and computer mediated communication where typing add oil um, was was you know quite was widely used yeah more than in spoken discourse but in written discourse typing add oil the calc of um, you know Cantonese Kayao um, was actually more frequent and down there that little box there is just Oh, because I was actually quoted saying, oh, add oil, I'm going to put my money on that. Okay, that's one of those words that I think is going to, you know, see increased currency. And what's interesting is that um, in 2016, we started getting interest from OED, presumably because of all the increased usage of add oil and, you know, the fact that it started um, getting interest from journalists and linguists as well. Um, OED had its wonderful kind of requests and for attestations and and you know suggestions and then in 2018 there it was in the OED so um, that was just a really very sort of instructive example or illustrative example of um, how uh, users themselves you know can make a difference with regard to how much world Englishes or, or vari um, lexical ver lexical items in world Englishes um, can be used, um, you know, with a lot of vigor um, and, will, and uh, with widespread currency, and how that then can lead to increased um, um, recognition, increased intelligibility, and you know, ultimately uh, increased acceptability. And so it, um, this is just quick snapshots of, uh, of you know, what the OED can how, what the OED can do for um, academic research and teaching. Thanks very much.